So thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Keith Krauss. I'm a manager in the AI infrastructure department of NVIDIA. And kind of specifically, I'm on the team that works on Rapids. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of detail out what Rapids is and kind of how we've been working, working on Rapids and building Rapids. But at a very high level, Rapids is an open source collection of libraries designed to accelerate data science by running the entire data science pipeline using GPUs. So kind of to dive in, we're, we're in a day and age where basically every, every enterprise has become, an, has become this data-driven enterprise. And in doing so, we're just generating more and more data and having to analyze more and more and more data. And basically, we're, we're at the point where we're starting to kind of look at and hit exascale. And kind of the way, the way people have traditionally looked at and tried to tackle this problem is in the big data space. And so kind of a decade ago, it started with Hadoop. And so you had this, par you had this paradigm of you know, massively scale out and that every single kind of step in your pipeline, you would read data from disk and then write data from disk. And it was, it was really expensive because all of this reading and writing data is really expensive. And so then, Spark came around, and Spark's main claim to fame was that you know you read once, and then everything is in memory in Spark's kind of in memory data format, as well as then everything is built on top of this single data format, so I don't need to go through any additional copy and conversions, I don't need to write out to disk, as well as just more efficient kind of computation in general. But Today, we're in this, we've hit this kind of the same problem that we previously hit with Hadoop in that we're starting to see bottlenecks where we don't want to see them. And so kind of what this is, what this picture here is showing is that this is a really simple workload of basically just, you know, group, group by a column and get me essentially just the count of that column. And you can see here, this is like a 20 core CPU. We're actually just completely pegging the CPU and we're getting compute bottlenecked before we actually get memory throughput bottlenecked. And what's crazy about this is this is after the data has already been kind of parsed or decompressed uh, into memory, and that is typically a super expensive process where you'll also bottleneck at compute as well. And then if we kind of extend that query into more complex workloads and then also look into things like machine learning, then the, the compute bottleneck just becomes even worse. And so you know, how, how can we do better? What can we do to kind of relieve some of these bottlenecks and improve our data science performance? We, we need to focus on the full data science workflow. So kind of from beginning to end, everything from data loading, including kind of decompression, file format parsing, to then your data transformation, so things like ETL, feature engineering, into then running your analytics, doing traditional machine learning, graph analytics, into things like deep learning as well. Basically, we need to, we can't just pick and choose pieces to accelerate. We need to accelerate the entire pipeline, otherwise we hit uh, Amdahl's law, which basically says that the slowest piece in the pipeline is going to basically dominate your pipeline and you won't see benefits because of it. And so, you know, NVIDIA, NVIDIA has built GPUs and built accelerated processing using GPUs for a long time, but the stance was always, you know, just, just write CUDA kernels, program in like C, C++ and build implementations yourself. And we know in the data science, the data engineering communities, that's a non-starter. And so we need, to, we need to kind of work in this Python PyData ecosystem to provide basically as close to a drop-in replacement for existing tools uh, so that there isn't this kind of friction in adopting new tools for data scientists and data engineers. But at the same time, we want to keep the performance that GPU acceleration offers you so that you can get these kind of rapid results and do more iterations on what you're trying to solve. And so GPUs are fast, but uh, people have talked about that there's too many adoption barriers for GPUs. You know, there's too much data movement to get data into GPUs, to get data out of GPUs. How do I move data between nodes with GPUs? Um, there's too many makeshift data formats, where if I have data format A and someone else has data format B, how do we work together? I'm going to have to do some nasty conversion on the CPU, and then I'm going to lose all my performance. Uh, as I said, writing CUDA, C, C++, it's a non-starter. You can't expect your data scientists or data engineers to really do that. And there, was, there wasn't this high-level API 
to use for data engineering, data science in general. And so kind of this is, this is kind of the classic GPU acceleration problem, where I have two applications that both use GPUs today, and they both offer great accelerations for their, their own kind of purpose, but the problem is in order to go from application A to application B, I have this kind of really gross data pipeline where basically I load data into my GPU, but then to get it to the other application, I need to move it back into the CPU to do some kind of conversion to then move it back to the GPU in what almost looks like the original data format for the second application to consume. And the problem is that those copy and converts that happen there in red are 99% of the time way more expensive than anything you're doing in application A or application B. And so you lose any semblance of acceleration that you hope to achieve. And so kind of one of the reasons kind of Rapids is here today is because of this question of, you know, what if we could go between these different stages in the data science pipeline and keep data on the GPU and not have to leave the GPU and do all of those gross copy and conversions? What kind of acceleration could we see? Uh, how would this change the data science process? And so from that question, we kind of, we looked into the big data community and we, we kind of took some learnings from the Apache Arrow project. And so uh, the Apache Arrow project is, it's a library for a uh, in-memory columnar data format. And basically the claim to fame of it is that kind of the big data ecosystem is standardizing around it and it's allowing interoperability between a bunch of these different big data projects. And so things like uh, Spark, Parquet, uh, Kudu, Pandas, et cetera, are, are all standardizing around this one memory format, so I don't need to do these really kind of expensive and gross conversions in order to get data from one, live, from one technology to another technology. And kind of in addition to that, it provides uh, really efficient on wire format, so I don't need to spend a ton of compute and a ton of time constantly serializing and deserializing my data in order to move it between processes. And so kind of building, building on top of the idea of Apache Arrow, uh, we, we released this open source suite of software called Rapids. And kind of at its core, Rapids, Rapids is designed to build bridges in the GPU community. That we want basically people to be able to write these modular data pipelines and experience GPU acceleration at every step. And so we have, uh, we have three main libraries today. There's QDF, which is, it kind of looks and feels like Pandas, but you get GPU accelerated performance underneath. You have QML, which looks and feels like scikit-learn, uh, but you get GPU accelerated performance. Uh, we'll be releasing QGraph, hopefully in the next month or two, which will kind of, it'll probably have a network X-like API. It's still being, kind of the API is still being defined somewhat. And then we're also kind of providing tie-in to things like your deep learning frameworks, and then GPU accelerated visualization engines as well. And so kind of we move, we move from this space of, you know, where how Spark accelerated Hadoop, but now Spark is getting bottlenecked by the amount of compute that you have. We move into this new space where uh, you do, you kind of pay a one-time cost to get data into the GPUs, and then everything that you want to do there is accelerated, and you don't have to pay the cost to move between those different, pipe, uh, those different steps in the GPU data science pipeline. And so kind of what, what is Rapids? How did we build Rapids? And kind of how we built Rapids is we wanted to learn what the data science community needed and build it based on their needs and based on kind of the feedback that the data science community gave. And so essentially what we did is we took both a top-down and a bottom-up approach in that, you know, NVIDIA, NVIDIA has built GPUs, we built CUDA to enable some of the world's most demanding workloads. And so we took the idea, you know, Rapids, we can get huge acceleration if we build libraries on top of CUDA uh, to get huge performance benefits, but at the same time, we need to build high-level, easy-to-use libraries in order for data scientists and data engineers to benefit them and then figure out how to tie them down into these, this optimized CUDA layer. And so it was really both a kind of hard guidelines in that we need the performance of CUDA underneath, but we need the usability of kind of high-level languages like Python and the PyData ecosystem on top. And then kind of following those principles, use that to kind of build, 
build libraries, build scalable systems and algorithms, and then continue to iterate on top of that. And so kind of the software of Rapids is available today. So you can go to GitHub, both QDF and QML are out there open source. Uh, QGraph should be coming in the next month or two. Uh, as well, we, additionally, we provide a Conda install. Uh, we are working on pip install currently. It should hopefully be coming in the next couple of months. Uh, and then we also provide containers both on Docker Hub and NGC. If you just want to pull a container, and that includes, uh, that includes some sample pipelines and including a multi-GPU uh, multi kind of mortgage workflow that we ran that uses, uh, does a combination of multi-GPU kind of ETL feature engineering into then running a multi-GPU XGBoost classification uh, to build a model. And so kind of let, let's talk about QML and QGraph first. And so kind of QML and QGraph are what we're thinking of as like the AI libraries of Rapids, where basically the idea is that we want to accelerate these machine learning, uh, graph analytics, and time series type algorithms to take advantage of the parallel compute capabilities of GPUs. And so we're targeting, kind of we're targeting everything that's in scikit-learn, NetworkX, uh, and then kind of taking that further in certain cases. Uh, like for example, graph analytics, NetworkX is kind of limited in both the size that it can do and the complexity of the algorithms that it can do. Uh, we can do quite a lot more using GPUs, and so we're going to try to provide that with the same high-level, easy-to-use APIs as well. But kind of everything from decision trees, uh, linear logistic regressions, clustering like k-means, uh, DB scan, maybe UMAP in the future, uh, as well as things like common filtering, and then things in graph analytics space, kind of your typical page rank, breadth first search, triangle counting, as well as some other things like Louvain modularity as well. And so kind of what, what, what can you expect to see in moving your workloads to the GPU? And so this is kind of an end-to-end -end pipeline working with a couple hundred gigabytes of CSV data. And basically, from moving, from moving the pipeline to the GPU, you can see here on a, a single box, and granted, it's, it's a big expensive box with 16 V100 GPUs, we can significantly, significantly outperform 100 nodes of Spark to the point where dollar for dollar you're doing significantly better performance-wise. And this includes everything from loading the data, uh, loading the data from disk, uh, in CSV format into then doing all of your kind of data cleansing, data transformations, feature engineering into then training an XGBoost model on it as well. And there's actually still a little bit of inefficiencies because we couldn't store the entire result set of the ETL in GPU memory all at once where we actually had to write out to system memory and then read it back in before training the XGBoost model, otherwise we'd run out of GPU memory and we're still seeing these huge speed ups. And we're continuing to work at addressing these inefficiencies to make these pipelines as efficient as possible. And then kind of in addition to that, in addition to being able to run single node, you were working, this, these are early results, but we're working towards enabling you to scale out as well as scale up. And so this is running across five DGX1s. So rather than 16 GPUs in a single box, uh, using 40 GPUs across five boxes. And so you can see here, we're getting huge benefit on kind of the ETL and data loading time just because you can, it's embarrassingly parallel, you can scale it out more. Uh, but on kind of the XGBoost training side, there isn't quite as much of a benefit. Uh, but we are working to address that uh, hopefully in the next couple months or so. And so you can see here, machine learning and XGBoost in particular is a great example where scaling up is really, really gives you a huge benefit over scaling out in that the algorithm just very quickly becomes communication bound. Uh, and so kind of you can see here versus it doesn't, you can keep scaling out with CPUs but you won't get much benefit in doing so. And then even in the GPU boxes, we're seeing, we're seeing huge speed ups over the CPU side, but in going from a single box, 16 GPUs versus five boxes with eight GPUs each, we're not seeing that much of a speed up just because you get bottlenecked even going over like four 100 gigabyte uh, network interfaces that uh, it, you just get bottlenecked in the communication between the boxes. And so kind of just some teaser benchmarks as well of some of the other algorithms. Uh, so kind of some of the first three, TSVD, PCA, and DB scan. We're, we're seeing some really nice benefits over scikit-learn 
and especially as you increase the amount of data, the amount of features that you're training on, those increases will just continue to grow. Uh, these, these are kind of our first pass at implementation as well, and so kind of as we continue to build out these libraries in the future, we will continue to optimize them and improve them further. And so kind of some of, some of the kind of algorithms that are in development right now and will be coming in the very near future. So we have k-means and k-n, which should be coming in the next few weeks. Uh, common filters, collaborative filtering, GLM, and random forests are all in the works as well and should be coming in the next month or two. And then additionally, we're working on some additional time series uh, and clustering algorithms as well as be, uh, Bayesian methods, which are a little bit further out in the timeline but are coming as well. And then this, uh, so KuGraph, the GPU Accelerated Graph Analytics Library, this will be released open source in the next couple months and just a teaser of kind of page rank and the kind of speed ups you can see, you can expect to see over Network X. Uh, in the worst case, we're getting a 130 times speed up uh, and then you can see we're getting like a 10,000 times speed up in certain cases. Um, so that will be coming soon and then kind of the initial algorithms you could expect to see would be like page rank, breadth first search, and triangle counting, and then things like Jacquard similarity, Louvain modularity, and other algorithms would be coming in the future. And so those, those were kind of like the machine learning graph libraries. Let's talk about just the general data frame library that allows you to do kind of your, your data transformation and some analytics as well. And so one of the questions that we get a lot in talking about rapids is, you know, is, is GPU accelerated ETL, is GPU accelerated analytics really needed? And the answer, the answer is yes, in that today data scientists are spending like 90 plus percent of their time in just trying to wrangle their data and struggling with wrangling their data as opposed to kind of fine tuning their models and iterating on their models to improve accuracy and solve the problem that they're actually trying to solve. And so if we, if we can drastically speed up kind of the ETL data transformation, data wrangling step, um, we can allow them to do a lot more iterations and fine tune their models a lot more, which basically directly translates to better results both for the business and for the data scientist. And kind of as a, as a side note to that, we want to we wanna get rid of the caffeine addiction in the data science world, where we're, we're tired of someone kind of kicking off an ETL job or a training job and then being like, well, this is gonna take half an hour, an hour, I'll go grab a cup of coffee. And then coming back, oh, there was some random error, all right, I need to tweak something, rerun it, let's go grab another cup of coffee. We, we want kind of this almost instant feedback loop so that users can work a lot more productively as opposed to kind of almost this fire and forget style of working that they kick it off and just hope for the best and then come back later and with their fingers crossed and then see if it either succeeded or failed. And so kind of the first step in enabling this is this QDF GPU accelerated data frame library. And what this library does is it uses the Apache Arrow data format underneath and then provides a pandas-like API. It's about 90, 95% the same as pandas. There's a few places that we differ, uh, mostly surrounding multi-indexing and indexing. Uh, but it gives you kind of all the things you're used to of like unary and binary operations, joins, merges, group buys, filters, um, as well as doing some really cool things with user-defined functions, which I'll touch on a little bit, and accelerated file readers as well. And so kind of what QDF looked like up until a couple weeks ago was it was a split between these two libraries, libgdf and pygdf. And so libgdf was this low-level library containing C and C++ APIs and then the actual kind of CUDA kernel implementations of all of these functions. And it also provided some low-level functionality like being able to export and import these GPU data frames using CUDA inter-process communication and then things like sorting, join, group by, and reduction kernels. Uh, PyGDF was the Python library that provided the Pythonic interface on top of it and kind of provided the integration into the PyData ecosystem. And so things like being able to easily create 
uh, GPU data frames from things like NumPy arrays, pandas data frames, pi arrow tables, as well as just general Python objects. And then also uh, really cool is being allowing the user to write just very naive Python user-defined functions and then actually just in time compiling those into GPU kernels using Numba. So that even if you don't have like a built-in function, you can still get GPU accelerated performance for it. And so today, we're just about done with a big refactor where we're moving libgdf and pygdf are going away and there will just be qdf. And so it is a single repo. It's already combined into a single repository containing both the low-level implementations and the high-level wrappers and APIs. And kind of part of the reason for doing this is that you know, when we originally were building out PyGDF and LibGDF, it had a very Python-centric view of the world. And even though this is PyData, we, we want QDF to be language agnostic to a certain point, where if the community wants and wants to contribute R bindings or Julia bindings or like even Java bindings, for example, QDF will provide a natural place for those to live and then also allow kind of the same things that the Apache Arrow library is allowing in that really efficient kind of handing off between these different languages without the kind of typical steep performance penalties that you see from it. And then uh, in addition, we're, we originally used CFFI to bind the Python to the C layer and we're moving to Cython for better integration into the PyData community and just for better maintainability as well. And so kind of just to give you an example, fortunately these are a little bit outdated so it still references PyGDF, but just to show kind of the usage of the library a little bit. You know, it's just your Python, standard Python library import PyGDF. Um, and then for example, to go from a pandas data frame to a GPU data frame, it's a single line of from pandas. It's the same from numpy arrays, it's the same from pi arrow tables. And it's the same to go back to those as well. It's just two pandas or two arrow, for example. And then in addition to that, you have kind of like, typical things that you would do in pandas where, for example, you can run a query. Uh, so for example, filter the data frame where my ink earn column is greater than or equal to zero. Um, and then kind of more advanced things like writing a user defined function where you can basically just very naively define a pure Python function as a definition and then tell it, call this apply map function. And what that does is basically, uh, element-wise in that column, it will run that Python function, but it doesn't just run that Python function like it normally does, it actually takes that function, just in time compiles it into GPU machine code, and then runs that on the GPU. And so you can write really flexible things in just very naive Python and get GPU accelerated performance on it. And so kind of every everything in QDF is single GPU. And the way we're moving the way we're kind of scaling up and scaling out is using a library called Dask. And so for those, for those who aren't familiar with Dask, Dask is a distributed computational scheduler uh, built to integrate with the Python data science ecosystem to allow you to scale your workloads from anything to using all of the cores available in your laptop to scheduling it across all of the nodes in a supercomputing cluster. And kind of why, why we're using Dask and what, like, why Rapids uses Dask to both scale up and scale out is that Dask is it's extremely modular in that it's got essentially different modules for scheduling, the compute, uh, handling data transfer and communications, uh, handling essentially like out of core memory caching and everything like that. They're all separate modules and you can kind of plug in your own implementations where you want to. And so for us, what this means is that we can easily run multiple Dask workers per node. So we can run essentially like a Dask worker per GPU, and then it becomes the same execution and programming model, whether you want to run across like two GPUs in your desktop or across a thousand GPUs in your data center. And that it's basically the same code and that we, we kind of handle everything underneath the hood for you to be able to scale up or scale out uh, your application. And so kind of looking at QDF first, uh, we have a library called Dask QDF, which it uses the kind of efficient single GPU primitives that we've built underneath the hood in a MapReduce style, uh, in a MapReduce style operation, and then exposes kind of the same high level API for users. And then kind of some of the things that we did 
Uh, if you look at DAS data frame, which uses pandas underneath, we plugged in our QDF GPU accelerated primitives. And then in addition to that, we, we kind of pulled out the typical Dask communication paradigm, where Dask typically pickles objects and then sends those pickled objects over TCP to other workers. What we did is we kind of removed that and plugged in, uh, plugged in right now that instead of actually pickling the object, we generate what's called a CUDA IPC handle, which you can think of it as essentially a pointer that can be shared across processes. And we only ship that. And so when communicating from worker to worker, communications are essentially free because all we're shipping is a pointer as opposed to actually sending any data. And then as we look towards kind of scaling out to multi-node, we're using, uh, we're working with the open UCX community and OpenUCX is essentially a communication abstraction layer that allows really efficient communications taking advantage of any hardware present. And so what this means is that if you have advanced hardware like InfiniBand or 100 gig Ethernet with Rocky, we can use techniques like GPU RDMA. But if you don't have them, we can easily just fall back to TCP as well and still be way more efficient than using kind of pickle in order to serialized data to ship over a wire. And then in addition to that is say all of your workers are within a single node, we could take advantage of things like NVLink and PCI Express peer-to-peer -peer communications so that you don't need to do any unnecessary kind of network data movement. And then kind of looking, looking at the machine learning side as well, um, it allows us to build these distributed both scale up and scale out machine learning algorithms as well in that we can a, natively integrate with Dask plus QDF, and so it allows us to easily take in data that's already distributed across multiple GPUs, and then we can use Dask to initialize uh, this library called Nickel, which is a, it's a collective communications library. And so it basically provides, provides easy to use primitives for really efficient things like, hey, I need to uh, reduce my data and then have a copy of that reduced result across all my workers. Or um, for example, I need to take this, this chunk of data that only exists on one worker and scatter that to every single worker. And so Dask gives us the ability to call these nickel primitives really easily. And then Dask also gives us the ability to kind of synchronize all of the workers, which is really needed in a lot of these machine learning algorithms, uh, but still kind of take advantage of all of the GPU acceleration and hardware advantages that are available to us. And so looking to the future, what are some of the things that kind of you can expect from Rapids over the next couple of months? Uh, so on the, the QDF GPU data frame side, we're going to in continue to improve the performance and the functionality across both single GPU, single node multi GPU and multi node multi GPU. Uh, in the next few weeks, we're gonna be actually releasing a GPU accelerated string package. And so this is going to be similar to using kind of pandas string functions, except provide an actual native GPU implementation uh, with some really nice acceleration, and I'll show some early results. And then we're going to continue to build out our accelerated data loading things. So for example, today we have a semi-limited CSV reader. Uh, we're going to continue to increase the functionality and performance of that CSV reader, and then you should see things like a parquet reader and an orc reader coming in the near future as well. So the first thing, QString, uh, it's gonna follow, it's gonna follow the Pandas API for working with like arrays of strings. And you can see here kind of some, some standard functions of like converting all the strings in your column to lowercase, finding a substring in a string, or slicing a string based on kind of some indexes within the string. You can see some really big speed ups. And these are all single GPU as well. And then accelerated data loading. Uh, so this is something that we, when we were first building out Rapids, we didn't, we didn't think we were going to need to tackle immediately. But as we kind of built out some data science workflows and started to test Rapids and applications, we quickly found that data loading was the bottleneck. Um, and so this, uh, this chart here is from a blog from the Apache Corral project, which it's a project out of IBM Research designed for really efficient uh, distributed storage, taking advantage of modern hardware. And so you can see here that kind of all of the typical data science formats like JSON, Avro, Parquet, Orc, they all get bottlenecked in getting data into memory by the CPU. And so as we continue to build out 
these GPU accelerated file readers, we should see some really nice speed ups. And see, if you notice, CSV isn't even on this chart because CSV is actually one of the least rigidly defined formats, and so it actually makes it one of the trickiest ones where the performance would be even less than JSON here. And so we have, we have a CSV reader out there today. It follows the API of Pandas Read CSV. It isn't completely full featured yet, but it's absolutely usable, and we're seeing some uh, really big speed benefits on it where typically it's a greater than 10x speed up over Pandas. Um, there is a work in progress pull request for the Parquet reader out there already. Uh, it should hopefully get merged soon, and then we're going to continue to uh, improve upon it. The ORC reader, you should see a pull request over the next couple weeks. And then we're starting to investigate what it would look like to handle actual decompression and compression on the GPU as well, so that you can essentially just ship compressed data over to the GPU, and then we accelerate the decompression, accelerate the file format parsing, and then you can go into your actual kind of transformation and ETL steps. And then something else, uh, we've been working, we've been working with, the Anacon with Anaconda and kind of the open source ecosystem in helping to define and drive adoption of what's called the Python CUDA array interface. And what it is, it's basically like a standard metadata for n-dimensional arrays on the GPU to describe their ways, their arrays, sorry. Uh, so kind of similar to how NumPy has a standard metadata for describing its arrays. We're trying to do the same thing on the GPU, which basically what it'll say is, uh, here's the memory, here's the pointer to my memory, here's my size, here's my data type, here are my strides, here are my shape, to basically allow all of these different GPU accelerated array libraries to interoperate with each other without kind of the typical performance hit of having to copy off to a NumPy array to then copy it back to the GPU in what's essentially the same format that it started in. And so Numba, CuPy, and PyTorch are the first libraries to adopt this interface. And kind of the current state of things is the Numba library basically allows for any, anything that exposes this CUDA array interface to come in. So what this means is that if I define a CuPy array or a PyTorch tensor, I can then run Numba just-in-time compiled functions against those arrays natively. Uh, we're working with the PyTorch and CuPy communities to allow them to accept CUDA, CUDA array interfaced objects as well, so that I'll be able to go, for example, from a PyTorch tensor to a CuPy array to a Numba device array and kind of any combination thereof without any kind of big performance hits in doing so. And so with that, uh, join the movement. Everyone can help. Rapids, Rapids is open source. Uh, we're built on top of the Apache Arrow project, which is open source. And then this original, a lot of this work originally started in the GPU Open Analytics Initiative as well. And then as the work has matured, it's moved into the Rapids project, uh, where all of these are basically built around accelerating the open source data science ecosystem. So everything from feedback, documentation, pull requests, anything, it, it all helps. And additionally, we, we're hiring at NVIDIA. If you're interested to help us build the future, come talk to me. We're basically hiring across the board as far as like Python, DevOps, CICD, uh, build and release packaging, uh, general data engineering, data science, as well as CUDA developers. And we have, we have internships for the summer as well, if you're interested. So if you, if you want to help build the future of Rapids and the GPU accelerated data science ecosystem, please come talk to me. And with that, thank you, and I'll take any questions. Thank you, uh, great presentation. How um, did you make a decision to not go lower level and, for example, and build it into NumPy as a, a completely abstracted for the for the user, allowing NumPy to leverage, which also under underpins pandas, etc., and just to make it abstracted rather than another library to which we never know whether adoption will be uh, sufficient to let's say enterprise users. Mm -hmm. So, so we've actually a lot of a lot of the Apache Arrow developers are actually Pandas developers as well, and we work. We've been working very closely with the Apache Arrow community. We've talked to a lot of these developers, um, and basically, in talking with them, the consensus was that 
we shouldn't try to just build something that if you use Pandas today, it just works. That Pandas, Pandas and NumPy, they were built like a decade ago and they were built on kind of the state of data science community and hardware a decade ago and that we shouldn't necessarily confine ourselves to what Pandas and NumPy allow you to do. And then addition, additional to that, there's a lot of things that you can do on the GPU that you wouldn't even think about doing on the CPU. And so kind of by having a separate library that looks and feels like it but isn't the exact same, it gives us the flexibility to kind of provide additional functionality that wouldn't make sense to provide within Pandas or NumPy today. Um, hi, uh, thank you for your speech. Um, my question is, uh, as a data scientist, uh, not very familiar with hardware part, uh, really my preference would be uh, easier to adapt would be better. Uh, I'm not quite sure, um, I, I bet you, you definitely have. <laughs> uh, have you heard about uh, the OpenAI uh, currently launched the collaboratory which offer uh, basically uh, hardware accelerator uh, in the cloud, uh, including not just GPU, but also TPU. Uh, for, for me, using um, uh, Jupyter Notebook a lot, it's awesome, uh, unbelievably easier, because it's exactly the same code. You can just uh, change the accelerator. Uh, no need to uh, rewrite the code. So how do you think of uh, comparing of that uh, project with yours, uh, what is the uh, advantage? Because uh, I think you should have some advantage uh, compared with that. And also, um, from the graph you showed us how data get processed from CPU to GPU, it seems so complicated. But why uh, OpenAI make it so easy for the uh, for the data get processed or the uh, code get uh, adjusted to GPU? Uh, thank you. Sure, so OpenAI is kind of more focused on neural networks and deep learning. What Rapids is focused on is kind of the steps before deep learning and neural networks in kind of all of the things that you still typically have to do. So from everything from loading your data from disk or from a database, for example, into then kind of all of your data wrangling, data munging, feature engineering, and then kind of more traditional machine learning, graph analytics type use cases where OpenAI and someone correct me if I'm wrong, is more focused on kind of training deep neural networks. And so for the case of deep neural networks, the amount, the kind of the amount of operations that you have to do is a much smaller subset than general data science. And so for kind of for those things that OpenAI is targeting, uh, the, T, the TPU, for example, GPUs, CPUs, they all have implementations, whereas kind of in the traditional data science world, um, you have GPU and CPU. So like, for example, to go between Pandas and QDF, it's absolutely minimal code changes. The only places that we really differ API-wise are in regards to multi-indexing, where people typically fight against it as opposed to work with it, is what we've seen in Pandas. So we made the decision that, you know, we're not going to support multi-indexing. Um, but in general, you could almost do import QDF as Pandas, and your code will just work. And so then that makes it really easy to switch between CPU and GPU. Uh, that being said, I'm, I'm not an expert on TPUs. I don't know exactly what they support and what they don't support, but my understanding is that kind of because this is more general purpose parallel computing, that it doesn't necessarily fit the TPU execution paradigm well. No, it does not. That still runs single threaded on the CPU. All right. I think we have to let the next group in. So let's thank uh, Keith.